Hi, everybody. I want to welcome every one of you and also the listeners on the radio on behalf of the organizing committee of the IWW in the German language area to our panel from COVID to collective action. Firstly, I want to make a short announcement. Uh, we have a German translation. Es gibt eine deutsche Simultanübersetzung. Dafür geht ihr einfach auf den Link, den ihr unterhalb des YouTube-Videos äh, findet und dann gel gelangt ihr in den deutschen Kanal. Ein großes Dankeschön schon jetzt an die, äh, an die ÜbersetzerInnen. Okay, back to English. Uh, my name is Sonja, I live in Zurich and I have worked in different industries and I'm moderating this panel today together with Jule from Leipzig. Uh, she's in the local group there and works in the university. We are happy to welcome you and also our guests from Britain and uh, North America and also someone from Australia who will introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, what are we going to do? We want to introduce our organization, the Industrial Workers of the World, and then we will talk about for about 50 minutes about the current situations, the difficulties and also chances that arise for us as organized radical workers with the so-called corona crisis. This means for the people listening or watching on YouTube that you can comment below the video if you have any comprehens comprehension questions. But during this first 50 minutes, you cannot really actively engage in the discussion. After that first part, however, um, we will close uh, for the listeners on the radio, but open the discussion and everyone is invited to write questions or comments into the comment section below the, the video on YouTube. Then we will try to include all of your questions and read them loud for our guests here in the panel. Okay, then I pass the word to Jule. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Jule, I'm also chairing the meeting and I'm going to introduce you to the IWW, um, the Industrial Workers of the World. So the IWW is a grassroots worker-run international union for all workers in all workplaces dedicated to organizing both on and off the job in our industries and our communities. Founded in 1905, we stand by the principles written in our preamble that the working class and the employing class have nothing in common and that the wage system must be abolished. We're organizing from below, based on solidarity, we are forming the structure of the new society within the shell of the old in accord with these three principles. First, education. Knowledge is power. Is power. To build power in our shops and other parts of our lives, we organize several educational events to share strategies, tools and experiences of struggles we had. Experiences from all our IWW sections around the world have been included in these events. Secondly, organization. We want a world that is built on human needs. This vision is currently opposed by capitalist forms of exploitation. We organize as global as the capital, talk and learn from each other. We don't let us divide it by origin, race, gender or resident status. Third, emancipation. Emancipation is if we stand together in solidarity and we take what we deserve across national borders without the permission of existing institutions. This includes all spheres of life, in the kitchen, care work, the shops, and the struggles with landlords and state agencies. The IWW's history is full of successful organization strikes and radical action, but also of defeat, criminalization, and loss. Traditionally, we are a union which stands for all workers. This was and is an important strength of the industrial workers of the world. Within the wage system and capitalism, our focus always has to lie on the opposed interest between the working class and the capitalists. That's why we look back at a history which is coined by women and address feminist issues within the working class. Also, many of our members are migrant workers or were people of color workers already back in days when other unions were strongly segregating and excluding them. And we have always organized super precarious workers, temporary workers, freelancers, and on-call workers. We are organized in local branches across the world. 
Here we talk about the unionizing we make at our workplace and support each other in our campaigns and actions. Since we are a grassroots union, there are no central boards or paid functionaries deciding for us how and where to organize. All branches and IWW unions make the decisions on their own, according to their experiences and their needs. Today we have branches not just in North America, but also in Australia, Turkey and across Europe, including Greece, Belgium, the German language area, UK and Ireland, Iceland, the Netherlands and Italy. Because of, of the very different legal, economic, political and historical situations, all these regions and countries in all the sorry, um, political and historical situations in these regions and countries, our practice and experience differ locally. A few weeks back, all over the world, governments decided on a lockdown with more or less severe penalties for people who took actions against it. Like in every crisis, the contrasts between the classes are increased and much more visible now and in the time to come. The most precarious amongst us are stuck the hardest. Many temporary and on-call workers lost their income without the possibility to get state money. The labor agreements in the health sector were basically invalidated overnight. Children should be homeschooled, which is not possible for many parents. On the other hand, monocultural farmers in central European countries still are allowed to call for thousands of super precarious workers from other countries for the harvests. Despite of the situation, these workers are supposed to live in very current circumstances with no chance to ever meet the security measures in order to protect them from COVID-19. But, but in a lot of places around Europe and around the world, solidarity networks formed and people started to organize and to build structures. In some places, this also includes illegal help and work-related questions or even wildcat strikes. In other places, people organize the strike against rent. In many cases, the IWW is part of such projects or even started them. This brings us to the talk today. We would like to know from our guests how their work and probably their lives have changed due to Corona, but also what are the perspectives for us as an international union. So, and now we like um, we finally would like to introduce you to our panelists. Um, thank you all for being here. We will start with the short video statement from a fellow worker from um, Melbourne. So the Australian workers, Australian bodies, um, cannot be with us due to the time difference, so they cannot be live with us, but they um, answered some of the questions beforehand. And now there comes the introduction of um, Tristan from Melbourne. My name is Tristan. I'm an Industrial Workers of the World member in Australia. I was the Regional Secretary Treasurer of the Australasian Regional Organizing Committee of the IWW for the last four years until December 2019 when I um, reached my term limit. Um, at the moment, I'm one of the people organizing a rent and mortgage strike across the country here in Okay, Australia. I would like to pass the word to Nera, the Northern American. Brendan, he, him. Live um, streaming is on. I am the uh, national press officer for the IWW in North America, and my general membership branch is in West Virginia. Yeah, my name is Max Mbaru, and I'm the chair of the organizing department board uh, in the North American region, and I'm based in the Montreal, Quebec branch. Hello, I'm Brianna. My pronouns are she, they. I'm in Kansas City, Missouri of the United States. I am on the organizing department board and also with the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. Russ from Weisra. Hello, my name is Russ Spring. I'm uh, based in Birmingham in uh, England. And I'm the Regional Secretary of the Wales, Ireland, Scotland, England Regional Administration, uh, which is 
that there's two administrations of the union. One is in North America and one is based here in the, in the UK. Glamrock. Okay, uh, hello. My name is Sigve Haug. Um, I am living in Switzerland and currently I am the secretary of the, it's called JAM, Jura, the Alps and the Middle Land in Switzerland. And we are, um, we are connected to Glamrock, so the German speaking uh, area, uh, together with Austria and Germany. I'm working at the university and in, in the museum. Um, hi, my name is Juli. I am from Austria and I just recently joined the IWW. Uh, I'm with the membership branch in Vienna, although I'm based in Western Austria and I'm really happy to be here. Okay, thanks to all of you. I want to ask the first questions um, about the political situation and how this one has changed now with Corona and like generally and also how does this affect you as a left or as left radical unionists in your practice and this first one i would like to pose to nera to north america so in north america at the moment um in the united states in particular we have had over 60,000 confirmed deaths from covid uh, 97 percent of u.s residents are currently in shelter at home orders and much of the u.s economy until very recently has slowed down because of covid what this means is many of our members who work in grocery and retail and in healthcare in particular have been affected both by the fear of uh, um, contracting COVID, but also the fear of losing their jobs. And right now in those industries, we have been working to ensure that individuals who work in those industries understand what their um, country's guidelines are, both in Canada and in the United States as well as some information about COVID, how to protect themselves from it, and also how to make demands from their employer to ensure that they have hazard pay, protective equipment, and that their workplace maintains social distancing. How is that in the UK? Hello, yeah, here in the UK, we are currently about 27,000 deaths from COVID and we're set, I think, to probably have the biggest death rate uh, in, in Europe. I think uh, we will be beyond the United States, but we're expected to overtake everybody else. Um, the, there's, there's a sort of truce amongst the political parties so uh, the opposition, which is the Labour Party, are, are not prepared really to make any real criticism of the uh, Conservatives' handling of, of the uh, um, crisis. It's, um, it's been interesting that uh, it's, it's brought up some issues. For instance, there was a stockpile of, uh, of protective personal equipment, which over the past uh, six years or so, the government had run down the the stockpile uh, and then on top of that basically they just didn't uh, prepare for the crisis when obviously we there, there was notice that it was um, on the loose uh, in in the east and it was heading our way and the government did nothing instead it was preoccupied with its own uh, internal uh, business and the business of uh, Brexit 
And so there, there's plenty of room for the government to be criticised. But at the moment, the political parties, are, 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 say, are basically holding this truce. So in terms of the economy, um, we're under a lockdown here for we have been for about four or five weeks um, and they still haven't quite got the uh, the, the peak of the, of the deaths under control. So we're expecting the uh, lockdown to last uh, several more weeks. I would say um, you could noticeably see the uh, reduction in, uh, in business. Uh, a lot of our members have been laid off or have been what they call furloughed, where the government agrees to pay 80% uh, of their wage uh, whilst they're whilst they're out of work at the moment but uh, lots of the um, lots of the um, uh, moves that the government brought into place were all aimed at uh, at, the, at the employers rather than the employees so the is it the bosses rather than the workers and so it left left it at the boss's discretion as to whether or not they would apply to the government for help. Um, it's that strange situation that in, 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 in the UK, there's, it's been heralded that the low paid, lots of low paid workers, or as they call them, key workers, uh, are being uh, valued far more than they were previously. But at the same time, uh, our evidence is that uh, bosses at the same time are treating them just as bad, if not worse than before, because now they're putting them at risk of, of uh, contracting the virus. Okay, we will come back to that in a minute, but I we have the, the luck to have Brianna with us, who is working with uh, imprisoned fellow workers. And we read a lot about um, how this crisis affects people in prisons, how it is so hard to have the, the security measures really um, installed in prisons. Could you tell us a bit about the situation generally and especially now with the lockdown situations and this problem in, in the prisons in the US, Brianna? Um, yes, you're exactly right. Uh, the conditions are terrible anyway, and then adding a pandemic on top of it is a human rights nightmare. Um, people are dying in prison. Um, a lot of prisons don't have any protective equipment at all. Uh, social distancing is not an option. They also, many of them don't clean the common areas, the cafeterias, the kitchens, the recreation areas. They don't, they don't let them have cleaning products to be able to clean the surfaces. Um, but news travels so slow in and out of the prisons because we have to rely on mail. Some prisons now have stopped allowing mail for up to two weeks. So we, we don't know how many people are sick or dying. We just don't know. Um, and that's, that's where it's at with the prisons. Uh, we have set up phone apps. People are writing letters. Uh, some, now, some places are doing better. There are county jails who have actually allowed the community to bring soap and to donate it to the prisoners in the jail, and they actually let them have the soap, which is uh, barely adequate, um, but better than nothing. Uh, one prison in Texas, the person I talked to told me that they actually have the cleaning products they need. So there are some small uh, incidents where we are hearing that people are being treated like humans, but for the most part, we don't know what's happening and people are dying. Thank you for telling that. Um, we would like to know from you how your, like, your work you're doing, the unionizing, the going into the industries, into the shops, um, being in contact with people who prepare for, for fights or for strike um, has changed now 
And for that, we um, this question we also asked to Australia, to Tristan, and he gave us um, an interesting answer, answer we would like to share with you now. Um, I'm so glad you asked that. Second the, question. Because are conditions are so bad every day, there is um, a lot of communication we receive actually just wants to unionize. Um, so many I'm letters. sorry, um, so many I'm sorry. Help. I work in the video again. Construction industry, uh, in large oh, scale sorry. Commercial construction. And actually the government okay, sorry, Brian. Okay, I should respond now? Sure, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so many of the letters that we receive um, uh, just talk about unionizing because the conditions are so terrible anyway. The pandemic is just another horrible condition on top of many horrible conditions. So there's actually a renewed effort towards unionizing in the prisons right now. People want to form branches. Uh, just before the pandemic really hit, I had reached out to all of our contacts in prison to get everyone renewed and update memberships and all those sorts of things. So right when the pandemic hit, we received tons of letters renewing memberships, wanting to start branches, wanting to know how they can be more involved and engaged in the union. Uh, also, one of our IWAC founders, Habachi Lamar, that's H-Y-B-A-C-H-I Lamar, L-E-M-A-R, um, was released from prison and has uh, really taken a lot of time doing international outreach. So if um, prisoners or prison support groups in other countries would like to get in contact with us, uh, Lamar would love to be in contact. Um, so the pandemic has not slowed down the regular organizing we had going anyway. Uh, if anything, it's a motivational factor for people to really um, enhance their efforts. Okay, thanks. So maybe now we can um, see the video. Second question, are there any conflicts in your companies or industries that arise? Second question, are there any conflicts in your companies or industries that arise despite or because of the corona crisis? Uh, in my industry at the moment, there's actually a big fight over whether we should stay open. I work in construction industry, uh, in large scale unionized commercial construction. And actually the government, the employers, and the main unions have all joined forces to keep the jobs open. Um, a lot of individual workers think that this is a terrible idea, myself included, but feel like they have no choice but to continue going to work. Uh, the main construction union, of which I'm a member, has been silencing dissent and even publicly attacking members who speak out against keeping jobs open. So we hear that people are disappointed by the big unions and that now a lot of um, a lot of the conditions or the working conditions, the the things we we reached are under attack. How do you deal with that in your in your local branches? How do you reach out to to people who are more separated than than in other times, and also but also maybe more angry and more um, interested in in the IWW's work. Maybe people from Glamrock could um, say something about this. Or like, are there conflicts? Are there problems, disappointments with the, the big unions, which are kind of enhanced right now? Well, uh, okay, so this is Sigve from uh, from Jam uh, in Switzerland. Um, okay, so what we know is that uh, I think people said this already, there are uh, workers, they are, they are working in places where uh, 
the measures cannot be hold up or cannot be respected, for example, on, on construction sites uh, where it is difficult to align with the measures like keep distance or sometimes uh, impossible. We have members working in cleaning companies and uh, and they they have to go to work and uh, but all around in the society it is like you should stay at home you should keep distance but they are not uh, they are not uh, uh, yeah they don't manage to do this and then they have to go to to work and this is perceived as unfair um, yeah these are things we have heard about. Um, Many workers are also scared. The information is uh, not always clear to anyone, maybe. And what it becomes uh, obvious again is that, uh, as also said by the others, that workers in with with the low wage or in in uh, yeah that in low wage industries they are, they are exposed uh, more and and less protected than others. So uh, this this we see, we can see uh, yeah at the hospital certain people they now have to do twelve hours shifts. Financially, the self-employed people are hit very hard. Um, yeah, as usual, the the poorer your contract is, the the harder you are hit probably. So okay, these are these are kind of things coming up uh, again. Um, what we see people are doing, fellow workers are, are doing against it, also also people in uh, in Iveve, not alone, but they have started uh, new uh, forums or, or, or um, uh, activities. For example, in Switzerland, there is, a, there is a now a collaboration between some not only uh, international workers, uh, industry workers of the world, but also um, other unions and they have a Corona Soli initiative, a web page uh, trying to um, raise funds, help people give information. Uh, another movement uh, where uh, some of our members uh, is also very uh, engaged in at the moment is the so-called rent strike or because they have seen that, okay, there is the possibility for shop owners or, or uh, people to apply from uh, to get money, federal money from the government to pay the rent, but of course this just goes to the owner of of, uh, of your house or of your shop. So there is a with this rent strike, they try to put a new uh, new focus or again a focus on what is property and and uh, where is the money going in the end. Uh, what I've also seen in in uh, in our um, branch or not branch but in our Glamrock and in Switzerland, Austria, uh, Germany that the, the, there is the they also try to look at this uh, the, 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 the female workers fellow workers from a feministic perspective because this is also a component of course. Yeah so these were some some impressions from my side. Um, while uh, other were, uh, people in, in low-income industries, they have to work with really bad safety precautions. Uh, here in Austria, we went into lockdown like real fast from like almost one day to the other, which resulted in uh, a lot of people getting laid off. There have been 400,000 people unemployed since the start of this crisis, which is the highest number since World War II, the highest number the Second Republic has seen. Um, and what we see is that the employers, they can apply for a bailout fund, they can apply for financial aid really easily. It's a one-page form, while as the workers, the employees, they have to apply for social aid from the state, which takes a really long process and a really complicated process compared to um, the one the employers go through. Also, um, with the 400,000 people unemployed, one should think that there's a lot of organizing going on. But since we've got such strict lockdown um, 
measures. <laughs> uh, you don't really see how much people are really unemployed, and I don't think that people realize that how, how, how big a force they are. Thanks. That's um, a very strong thing you just said, like the how we reach people and how we deal with this situation. Um, do you in the in NERA in the States and Canada have any like projects which arose now um, under these new circumstances or are you like having a lot of trouble to continue your work as you used to do it in terms of organizing as a tool or means but also in terms of I don't know content or um, areas industries which are kind of lost now or coming to, to the IWW yeah, maybe Brendan, do you want to take a first stab at it and then I can chime in? Sure. <clears throat> so one of the issues that we've been facing um, as it relates to like our relationship with business unions was um, the grocery and retail stores have by and large stayed open as essential workers and the contracts for most of those workers are through the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, UFCW. They're in Canada and the United States. And most of those contracts that they signed prior to the outbreak were not the best. And most of the requests we've been getting online and through email have been from individuals who are in those industries who are upset at their local union from the UFCW um, not really enforcing their contracts or um, not really caring as much about what happens to their members in those industries. And so part of what we've been, what I've been trying to do on my end is connect uh, disgruntled members of the UFCW to resources locally for IWW members who can help them um, start organizing within their local to push for more militant action, to take direct action and to achieve hazard pay or protective equipment. Um, in my local membership branch, we have a member who is a dual carter. So he's both IWW and UFCW and he started a very big media campaign about what this grocery store Kroger was doing and combining that with some direct action from pharmacy tech workers, they were able to very quickly force Kroger to concede to protective equipment, hazard pay, social distancing, um, pretty much at the start when the lockdowns began um, across the US and around like mid-March. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, we've been receiving like yeah quite a diverse um, set of inquiries, um, and quite a lot of them are focusing. So we've we've kind of looked at it in, in three phases. The first phase being the people being pushed off of their work, and we've had a whole range of cases come around people who uh, want to make sure that their workplace will not be closed and win certain conditions about that people who want their workplace to be closed under particular conditions or they have been laid off or furloughed or fired um, and they would like to get some kind of pay for it. Canada and the United States have had somewhat different reactions but uh, nevertheless a lot of people have been left in a lot of poverty so some of those cases uh, are very unique and there, there have been um, a lot of our people are working in service industry uh, and restaurants and so on. And so a lot of those people have been pushed off their jobs. But a lot of people are still working in what are considered to be essential services, even though this category is very broad and all sorts of exploitative companies, which are in no way really essential, are you know allowed to sneak into the list and to continue working. And what's happened there is that employees are under a lot of pressure. Uh, employers are, you know, pushing people to work for less money, are pushing people to work in conditions that are unsafe, and people do really feel like it's a matter of life and death in some cases. And in this kind of domain, we have started, we begun receiving 
um, a lot of inquiries that let us know people have already taken an action. People have already begun organizing. People have taken some kind of militant action, whether it's a petition um, against the employer, whether it's a spontaneous meeting with their employer, whether it's a work stoppage. And these have been through like a variety of sizes of workplace, sometimes very small, sometimes very, very large. Um, and it's been a matter, it's been an interesting experience for us to uh, find a way to adapt ourselves to the current situation. There's been a wide diversity of opinion in our union about how to relate to the present situation in, in what to what degree will, um, uh, like, uh, do we need to stick to our program? Things take a lot of time developing those relationships that are very time consuming and under normal conditions would take, you know, uh, would, would take a workplace some time to develop versus people who feel that their lives are really you know in their hands and they feel like they're working at a bakery um, or something like that and they're working at a grocery store uh, uh, and they're under extreme uh, pressures and so different branches in our union have reacted to that question differently and i think after this in retrospect it will be very interesting to see like what were the impacts in society um, how much were we able to take advantage of the moment to help people um, and we're preparing for the third wave, which is uh, people being forced to go back to work as things slowly reopen, um, and in some cases, very hastily reopen. Uh, what way we'll be able to protect people? We also have a sense that some people are going to go back in a weakened state, um, while other people are going to go back in a state after they have been able to successfully organize a little bit, and they have been able to strike and take some action uh, and win protections, win raises, when those things are going to be taken back, how do we make sure that we protect them? Um, so those are some of the kinds of challenges we've been facing now. Uh, some of the most complicated ones are in states within the United States that uh, have very little worker protection on the legal level, and people have been forced to continue working. It's a, it's, it's a perfect storm of combination between uh, a place where the legal rules are extremely weak, where there's also a culture of anti-unionism and skepticism towards unionism, and as well where certain kind of political culture dominates that is looking at the virus as like a hoax or something that is not really a danger. And so there is even a division amongst the working class about you know, what should be the precautions, how much of a priority does it need to be. Um, and so it's been a very interesting time navigating uh, getting cases from the United, from, for example, the United States South uh, where there's a lot of energy uh, to organize and unionize now, but it's under like ext very extremely unusual uh, social and political and legal conditions. Thanks a lot. Russ, how is it in Vicera or in your branch? Um, how do you react to the crisis? What are your difficulties in your work? Right, yeah, well, um, uh, obviously a lot of the organising, uh, uh, ongoing organising things have, have been disrupted by um, by the COVID-19 crisis and have basically been put on hold. We've obviously moved to uh, uh, having all our meetings and everything by um, Jitsi or whatever, uh, doing it all online. A lot of the... Um, support that we've been given to uh, our fellow workers have been quite uh, individualized uh, that's part partly because we have a lot of members who are in fairly isolated workplaces as well um, we have had a few exceptions as uh, some uh, teaching uh, staff that we've that we've had a, a bit of a campaign round and also here in my local branch uh, a group of cleaners uh, uh, just talking about if I talk a little bit about the cleaners I think it really sort of highlights the way that the the crisis uh, affects people differently depending on where they are in the um in the socio-economic scale um so they work for um uh, they, they work at a college and uh all the uh educational staff will be members of the uh um, education union which is called uh, UCU the University and College Union who were uh, not 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 too bad not too bad a union uh, in, on the scale of things in in the UK 
then support staff would probably be members of um, either Unison or GMB, which are two of the bigger, big, biggest unions in the country and uh, are not generally that effective. Um, and then uh, the cleaners that, that we were representing are basically agency staff. So they're not employed directly by the by the uh, university and college. So that, that indicates how they're treated differently to start off with, that basically they're not employed by um, by the by their direct employers sort of thing. Instead, they're, they've been farmed out. Uh, so when the, the crisis first started to hit, uh, the, the cleaners were first of all, of course, uh, complaining that they hadn't got um, protective personal equipment that wasn't being provided for them. Also, there was a plan that the college would close down and, and a lot of the uh, ed educational staff would either just stop working uh, or they would be working from home and preparing lessons and doing things online whereas the cleaners were being told that they had to go into they had to go into work and several of them were concerned that they, they wanted to self-isolate they didn't feel that the protective equipment was was uh, uh, adequate that they were being put at risk and they'd got family members who who uh, they, they needed to protect and the response from their employers was was to hint that they wouldn't have a job to come back to if they were to self-isolate, so if they were to take steps to protect themselves. So you've got the higher paid staff were basically being told to stay away from work and because they could work uh, remotely then do so, whereas the uh, low paid staff were basically being bullied and threatened uh, with losing their jobs if they did anything to protect themselves. Um, as it was, they they decided that they were all going to self-isolate uh, and we advised them and supported them and the uh, agency uh, stood down. They they didn't follow through with their threats. They also, of course, sent them a letter saying that basically when they return back to work, they will be then be given protective equipment. Uh, so that, again, indicates a, a change in the way. So, um, yeah, a lot of the work we're doing is, is uh, uh, online. Obviously, meetings with management uh, are, are, are restricted as well. So I was talking to a fellow worker who had uh, been in a situation where he was online. The member was in the room with the manager, but he couldn't even see uh, the fellow worker that he was representing. So it was very, very awkward. But we got a success out of that. And I think that um, what we find in, in, in quite a lot of instances is that management try to bully workers but where you do challenge them they do tend to step back because they know that they're they're completely um in, in the wrong um in terms of industries that are staying open there's a lot of industries that are unnecessarily staying open uh and i think that uh, again there's a sort of split uh, amongst people there's some people who poo pooey the idea that covid19 is something to worry about um of course, when it first started coming in, then the, the government was saying it was only a, a minor cold. And there, there are people who still hold that view. And they also think that if you're not old or have got underlying health conditions, then you, you're going to be all right if you get the virus anyway. Um, yeah, um, part, part of the thing as well, of course, is that the, the, the shutdown it tends to be being enforced much more on a social uh, scale on, in terms of our social lives than it is on the economy. So you have this sort of uh, this uh, strange sort of situation where you're being told, for instance, that you, you, you know, you shouldn't do any socialising, you shouldn't go out, you should avoid going to the shops, you should stay indoors, uh, only go out for small, uh, for 20 minutes of, of exercise. But then at the same time, there's people who are going to work as normal. And uh, and and I think that uh, that's it would be interesting to see how long that lasts for. In terms of the, the, the general mood of of uh, of people, I don't I don't get a feel that there's any great uh, anger or frustration yet that that's that's um, developed. Um, 
it's really uh, for unions to see how they come out of this crisis to um, whether or not they can uh, highlight the, the, for instance, the paying conditions and the equipment loss, uh, lack of equipment and all the rest of it that's been highlighted by the fund. But I mean, it's it, just as a, a, a side thing that whilst this crisis is taking place, for instance, there's a 15 percent cut in the fire service. Uh, and, it, and it's certainly been slipped through the back door at the moment and uh, and it's getting no coverage whatsoever in, in the media. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. Sigve, you raised your hand. Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, second all what Ross said. It's um, what he's telling is uh, very familiar uh, to me, at least. Uh, like I'm also working at the university, so people, people having manual work, they have to go uh, and work. Uh, the building is empty, but you still have the the cleaners. They are there. Uh, they this seems not fair. Because we're all told to stay home, but then you have these uh, the, the manual workers. They have to go to work, and this is uh, uh, a divide we should maybe uh, try to uh, avoid or keep an eye on in our work, union work in in future. Maxim. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, another relevant factor for our context, which might be interesting, because one of the things that there are similarities, there are many differences in labor relations systems across our regions, but one of the things we've seen here is that uh, the establishment unions um, have had an extremely difficult time. Uh, part of the reason for that has been because they've become so dependent on the formal labor relations bureaucracy, um, especially in Canada. Uh, where we have a system where often like unions have to go through a very particular and rigid uh, like problem solving procedure that involves a government bureaucracy. Um, and in some cases in sectors, for example, like healthcare and education in one of uh, Canada's like uh, important provinces in Quebec, uh, the government just nullified by itself unilaterally the collective agreements for all workers in healthcare and, and education. Um, and in both countries, in Canada and the United States, the government initially uh, suspended the activity of the labor relations bureaucracies that uh, are you know, often depended on for, for example, the certification of new unions. And in Canada, often the, the, the procedures for dealing with pr the formal process for dealing with problems where the labor court will hear complaints and so on and so forth. And um, so this is also a, is both a big wake up call and a big opportunity that we don't know if the establishment unions will see it that way. Um, a lot of them have just shut down their offices and are working at reduced capacity. And I think it's, you know, it's a big credibility embarrassment for them. Uh, there are libraries that have turned themselves into food banks, while the union offices have not, you know, have not made those kinds of overtures and have not tried to go the extra distance to engage their, to engage their members. Um, and for us in the North American region and IWW, it's been a great uh, uh, opportunity uh, as well to kind of once again, um, highlight i guess our like comparative advantage is that for a long time we have we have been relating to the formal formal labor relations system uh in the countries that are in our jurisdiction with extreme skepticism and using them uh with as much as possible being extremely surgically you know precise about when and how we use them uh being very aware and skeptical of being kind of like trapped in the net uh, and in dependence on those systems. Um, and that's been uh, very useful for us. So our like fundamental you know, model of trying to encourage workers to build a social structure at the workplace that will be itself durable and capable and combative enough to win concessions from the employer and defend them over time 
uh, has uh, uh, been, you know, has been raised in the, to its level of relevance and pra uh, pragmatic interest for a lot of people and their organizing uh, because the formal channels of dealing through the labor relations system are just closed. Yeah, you're mentioning an interesting point that um, um, that's like well, like in other questions we have, um, also from like especially from our position as uh, from the organizing and education committee in Glamrock, um, that we have a lot of knowledge on how to unionize and how to organize people on how to have this conversation. We can estimate how much time it needs to build a union. We can kind of give advice or, or help people doing so. And we experience a kind of a, a growth at the moment, I'd say. Um, you also said that in our in your pre in the pre-call that um, a lot of people are attracted by the IWW and might be because the the the, the other unions sort of fail. Um, but we have problems to pass on this knowledge or like this our kind of educational task to to make people or to help people to unionize and we were having conversations already in Glamrock and within our committee how to maybe have organizing classes online or if it's possible or if the very the heart of the organizing thing can never be done digitally and we are very interested in your opinions and we know that, for example, in Portland, they have this crisis organizing um, handbook for new members, for people who are, I don't know, active in sort of solidarity neighborhood networks and need help or need advice. Um, how do you feel about that? And do you already have like had some positive or negative feedback from this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. So in terms for us, we our various branches ha are and have run a variety of different kinds of digital trainings, things from like how to be an external organizer, like how to be a consultant for people when they when workers come to us and they want to unionize their workplace uh, to and are, we're not used to doing digital trainings for like teaching people how to be organizers in their own workplace. Uh, for probably the reasons that like other educators will be familiar with, like there's so much lost in the digital, the digitization of education that we've been uh, very careful about it. Uh, but we're like, we have some policy around that. Um, but uh, essentially my feeling about it, my subjective feeling about it is that uh, there are many, as long as there are uh, significant and really any sectors of the working class that are forced to go to work and take those risks, um, we can't abandon our posts. We have to be at our post and we have, you know, different branches have set up hotlines, have set up channels through which workers that are continuing to work um, can contact us. And we set up meetings with them digitally, we consult with them. And insofar as uh, we need to intervene in a more physical way to help them out, then my impression is that people, people are ready to do that. People are not going to abandon their post uh, while other people are still on the job. Is there anything from Weiser on that? In terms of the uh, um, online training, we are looking. We we've just uh, quite recently developed a, a, a short organizer training called Your Job, Your Union, and it's the sort of very basics of organizing, and it's uh, condensed into a four-hour training session. And we're looking at. Uh, the possibility of us stripping it down even further. Um, one of the things that I maybe ought to mention is that um, here in the UK, uh, in, in Wales, Ireland, Scotland and England, we've organised a, a COVID-19 fund and basically we've we've offered uh, uh, our members the ability to, where they're in financial hardship, to apply to the union for, for help. And what that's brought with it is people basically um saying that they they want to get more involved they want to get more engaged uh it's also um given us the opportunity to to speak to people and find out a little bit about their workplace and everything so um certainly we'll be looking at that um online training but we also share 
the the belief that um it's not the best way of delivering organizer training but uh needs must and uh and that's part of the thing about being a um being a union like ourselves we we've got to be adaptable to to the situation the terrain that we operate in uh and hopefully that that will be another way that we can do it We have also, um, like with the uh, local group in Vienna, we tried having meetings online, uh, more formal ones, like a monthly discussion, but also like a pub meeting. <laughs> and it was really nice for me because, uh, as I said, I just recently joined, and it was a way of getting to know the other members that are 500 kilometers away, which usually would be quite an effort, but in that way, it's, it's some good that happened. Well, it's not, but uh at least there's some good coming from it which is um a network forming with people you never really met but i would also really look forward to have um personal contact because i, I don't think that digital video chats or something can make up for that but i think um providing online training would be a good start and maybe just for the people who want to learn immediately and maybe for them to later catch up that would be a good idea too also um you mentioned that um there was a financial fund set up in the uk uh the iww vienna has uh, done a similar thing uh, where workers that are in financial struggles can apply for money as well and we also established a legal uh, and social support structure which like, for example, I, I use that when I got laid off my job. I messaged the IWW in Vienna and they just, um, they messaged me back within a few days. And it was a really nice experience because when I messaged like the official state helpline, <laughs> they just, they, they treated me as a number. Whereas uh, the people in Vienna, <laughs> they were really nice to me and they were really welcoming. And I just felt so at home that they provided me with like individual support, and not just saying the same thing to everyone. Thanks, Yuli. Um, with an eye on the clock, I want once more give the word to Brianna, because after the first hour, which will be right in a minute, <laughs> um, the radio listeners um, are cut off, and we will. Um, yeah, go on with our discussions without them. But since um, you said that you're looking for contacts abroad um, of unions or um, organizations trying to organize prisoners or being uh, in solidarity with prisoners, um, maybe it would be a good thing for you to once more say something about that and also um, tell us your contact you sent in the chat earlier because I know that at least in Zurich, there are organizations um, who would be interested in that. Yes, thank you so much. Our email address is IWOCHQ for IWOC headquarters, IWOCHQ at gmail.com. And uh, that's probably the easiest way to reach me. So I'm not using a lot of time reading off RPO box. But um, yeah, people can email me and uh, I will connect them with Habachi Lamar. And um, we would like to talk to prisoners and prisoner support groups throughout the world. When IWAP was first founded, uh, there were prisoners in Canada, Germany, Australia, um, and a couple of other countries that were closely engaged with us here. And that when Lamar went back to prison, we lost those contacts. Um, but Lamar is back and says, hi, everyone. Um, and we would love to reconnect and build new relationships and, and build the union stronger and support prisoners. Thank you. Thanks a lot to you. And well, now we have to say goodbye to the radio listeners and thanks for being here. Um, we got a first question from the chat, which was actually posted from like a few minutes ago already. And I think it's really interesting and we could um, continue our discussion from there. 
Um, it was what our what are our plans as a global union to organize workers worldwide? How can we join our efforts together? And it was um, posed by a fellow worker, P from the IWW in Italy. Does anybody want to respond to that question from Italy? Hi, this is Brianna. I'm on the chat also, uh, and Akeep M replied that they would be um, in favor of building up the industrial unions and also linking people in company in companies that go throughout the world. And uh, also, there are companies that people work at on the outside of prison and on the inside of prison. Whole Foods, Sodexo, Aramark, um, so, so tying workers together inside, outside, and in different countries. Brandon, I think, did you want to speak? Yeah, um, so there's this uh, labor reporter, Sarah Jaffe, um, whose work I follow in the United States, and she just reported on this group <clears throat> that's newly formed, and they are currently tracking contracts, and when contracts are expiring, and they're trying to map it all across the United States so that they can see when contracts are planning on expiring and using that as a way to build regional structures that can assist workers if they're in a plant or in a workplace that needs support from their community. Um, and this is going to be used as a way to protect, I think she said around 5 million um, Americans will be up for contract negotiations in 2021. And the goal is to try to map every single contract in the United States, their expiration date and map them um, using things like Google um, Earth or, or, or different models. So um, I think one thing that could be really interesting is using maybe a platform like that to see where our biggest strengths are at the moment and how we can build sort of networks um, regionally. Maybe if you're in a larger city, this is really helpful too, where you can provide assistance, which shops are less organized or don't have um, any organizing efforts at the moment and using that to connect with workers um, in that industry, perhaps across your entire country or like, um, um, Brianna was saying um, across the world too, trying to map that out um, as much as you can. Someone else want to add something to that first question from the audience? Um, maybe I would just add that I think we have to own the fact that uh, we have not done a stellar job at international connections. We have some international connections we have internationally international guiding kind of rule book, but um, in general, we, we support the formation of new branches around the world. But there's there's a definite lack of a sense of like where is the ship sailing? Where do we have the collective conversations about which direction is the ship sailing internationally, and how we're going to navigate the whole like globe of different labor relations systems, different cultures, different expectations. Uh, people's different, um, uh, you know, aims at you know what they what they consider to be the 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 goal of unionism, the goal of worker activism, uh, and we desperately need to get our act together on that. We definitely we desperately need to like call for international meetings that can have decision making power and kind of like decide like bring information together and do you know a survey of the regions that we want to go after unfortunately i mean we can't go after everything at the same time but uh, i think it would be great to have like a unified strategic vision for that kind of a thing um the one thing where i think we do um uh, where we lack a sense of like command and control of a sense of like we have you know we have command over the, all the facts we have we have a sense of control over how information is flowing and how our union is developing is we can lead by values. And we have, a, our organization has 
several values, but one of the like most core values is, you know, uh, that action is at the heart of what it means to be a union, and that mobilization, without without diminishing the role of negotiation type activities in labor and industrial conflicts, that mobilization is at the heart of labor relations, and that uh, we want to be you know building democratic structures, and we want to be organizing where we are. One of the values that is extremely simple that we, we send out into the world is you're at a workplace, you're near a workplace, organize where you are. You have boots on the ground, go forth and organize at the point of production and be you know, very skeptical of any local laws that restrict your, the workers' ability to defend themselves at the workplace. And that value uh, spreads extremely far. People kind of know the brands of the union, uh, and it's a very infectious value. It, 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 it increases action in a non-linear fashion. Uh, so on that level, our union, I think, has a very uh, strong impact uh, uh, on the international uh, universe of, of, uh, of activist unions. Which is now, I want to, before Russ can um, have the word, uh, there was the question whether Nera, Weiser, Glamrock and all the others are interested in doing more regular calls and interviews like this one. And there was a huge answer, collective yes. And also, Brianna already said, I think you, you're referring to the same guy um, that you would vote yes. So I think what you just said is underlined by this uh, reaction. Okay, word to Ross. Yeah, um, I, I think um, what we have to do is, of course, is understand just how small we are as a as a as a union. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, it would be great for us to be able to call international campaigns and and uh, and and talk about organising industrially um, a, a, across a, 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 across the globe. But we are so few in numbers. Um, I think that really the focus has got to be. Uh, as uh, Max was saying there at the end, is that uh, concentrate on organising in your workplace uh, and sort of building from the bottom upwards. So whilst I, I agree that it would be better for us to have better communications between uh, the different parts of the union across the globe, I don't think that we should um, run away with any grandiose plan that uh, that um, that's going to enable us to um, uh, take capital on. On a, on a global basis. We've got a long way to go yet, unfortunately, fellow workers. That was a bit, <laughs> yeah, a realistic um, view, probably. Uh, we also asked a question to Australia. Um, maybe we want to hear his answer. That will be Good your part, Yuda. How do you see our strength as an international union in this special situation? Internationalism is our strength because it means that we can all push together for the same goals and demands across the world. The forces of capital are international, so we need to be as well. Um, it also means that we can learn from each other and hopefully not repeat the mistakes made in other places and um, hopefully do the things that worked in other places. Um, I also see strength in that we're flexible enough to adapt to local needs and not just repeat the same model everywhere, even if it doesn't work in our own local context. Is there any other question from the audience? Tech support? Otherwise, um, we can, well, maybe talk about, or shortly let Tristan talk about a point which was mentioned before by, I think, Sigve, the rent and mortgage strike. Um, he is organizing a rent and mortgage, mortgage strike campaign in, in Australia. And I think he, yeah. We can listen to him speak about that. That's number four, I think.
Jure? No, the, the fourth, the fourth video. Oh, sorry, sorry, it did, I didn't hear that. Uh, coming right up. Fourth question, how does further work locally look in terms of projects, but also of Fourth question, how does further work locally look in terms of projects, but also of means, i.e. organizing difficulties, chances, etc. Uh, locally, the big campaign that I'm working on is the rent and mortgage strike. Um, we're fighting for amnesties on rents and mortgages, blanket bans on evictions uh, and such. Um, it seems to have struck a chord uh, nationally. We've gotten a lot of interest, including over 17,000 people signing a pledge uh, to strike. Um, we've gotten a lot of national media attention as well, um, and even some mentions from politicians. Those, those uh, mentions have mostly been negative. Um, Policy-wise, we haven't gotten what we've been demanding, but we do think that we've changed the narrative um, around housing and renting in Australia in the corona crisis. Um, moving forward, we want to progress the campaign into a lasting union for renters, people in precarious housing situations, and, home, and the homeless. Um, these discussions are happening right now. Um, I see a need moving forward as well for campaigns in the areas of unemployment, wage support, and as always, fighting exploitation by the bosses, because that definitely hasn't stopped. Um, challenges include the isolation restrictions. That means we can't do face-to-face -face work. Um, that's made organizing pretty difficult. and We've had to come up with a lot of new ways um, to talk to people. Uh, also, the increase in surveillance by the state um, and resistance by moderate forces uh, to supporting our more radical demands, which we've faced in the rent and mortgage strike as well. Sigwe, do you have any like numbers or I I knew, know that the project started and that there are people actually trying to strike um, for rent, but how is the situation looking like now? Yeah, so okay, it was very interesting to hear uh, that they're doing something similar on a different continent. Uh, Yes, so in, in Switzerland, uh, some fellows, uh, so Wobblies, I mean, IWW um, w, uh, fellows are organizing uh, also a rent strike. And uh, I posted the link to this uh, thing. Um, yeah, so so the, the concept there is that people can print a pre-signed formula and send it to an anonymously or with name if they like to their landlord or any landlord and uh, the goal is to have three uh, three months uh, of i think it was that three months of rent um, uh, yeah discarded if, if you need that um, i think it is a very interesting uh, project it is not about work in the first sense but uh, it is about living so this is also <laughs> a very very extremely important part in our lives switzerland is uh, is a land where you have a lot of renters so i think about 60 percent of, of the population is living in rented houses you can imagine these are not the uh, 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 these 60 percent are not the rich people so uh yeah you depend on, on being able to pay your rent and uh it came up now uh from these guys fellows also because there is state money and this is again tax money and we know who has been who have been paying all these taxes and uh, so yeah people can apply for money to pay their rent so this money this tax money is then going to the landlords uh, so this uh, seems or is perceived as unfair, and uh, this is a little bit, uh, yeah, the background. Um, maybe we can uh, we can get in contact with the uh, Australian guys. I'll, I'll pass the 
the message. Um, I've just been wondering that ever since that uh, situation came up with lots of people not having money because they just got laid off, um, there's uh, been a discussion about the general basic income and I was wondering if maybe we'd campaign for that or if that was in, in our way of interest. Does anybody have a, a short or like a, an answer to that question? Probably would need an own panel to have a discussion about a basic income. But maybe someone has experience with, um, or like fellow workers have done stuff in that way. I don't know of anything like that. Sorry, can you just restate the question one more time? I didn't quite understand. Um, I was asking if, um, if it was in the IWW's interest to campaign for a general basic income, because as Sigwe said, it's like taxpayer money, and why go through all that trouble with, like, as perspective of state, bail out um, businesses and pay money to uh, workers directly or unemployed people directly if they can just give every everyone the same amount of money? I mean, that's good for mm -hmm. the economy and good for the businesses. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would allow... Um... I would kick it to Brendan to speak more generally as the press officer for like IWW's disposition towards those kinds of campaigns. But what I would just briefly say from um, an organizing perspective on what I've seen in Canada, where there is kind of an experiment for a large portion of the population right now happening where the government is giving people $2,000 a month for four months during like the lockdown. And then in addition to that, each province is giving additional kinds of money and then in, and in addition to that is giving 75% wage subsidy for employers. So it's, it's some kind of like, you know, experimentation going on. And then in Iceland as well, um, where we have a branch of the IWW, they've also seen, you know, subsidization of wages and other kinds of uh, logistics like that. And what we've seen is that employers are using this, in, uh, governments and employers are collaborating to harm people with this project by and large. So. Uh, as soon as wage subsidies come into effect uh, and employers are able to tell workers to come back to work, even though it is unsafe, they, 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 technically the regulations are not allowing people to give, to threaten people. But essentially what they're saying is come back to work and I will pay you less for the same amount of work you were doing before, or I will fire you. And then you will lose your access to, you know, the special subsidy. And it's same, similar things are happening in Iceland where people are basically give, being given um, like a direct, like a very limited set of choices where um, employers uh, are, are in, in these places where this kind of policy is happening. Employers are basically also saying, you know, they may, they may even be pocketing some of the money. They may be keeping some of the money for themselves, but saying to the government that it's cap going to some of the workers. Um, and many of the many people who are who are uh, like in need of the money, the the bureaucracy to go through it is it can be sometimes complicated. Uh, many people are excluded. Something like one third of all Canadians are excluded from the programs. Um, so, from an organizing perspective, I would say it's been uh, uh, it's been very tricky. Uh, the relationship between these kinds of experimentation with direct payments from the government or payments through employers, um, it's very clear from a Canadian perspective, that employers want to maintain the relationship of dominance of employers on workers. They have said many times now and more openly each time that they want people to remain like psychologically and institutionally reliant on their boss. They don't wanna give people direct money as much as possible. They want it to go through the companies because otherwise it will interfere in that relationship. Um, and so I think any kind of the dis and that's that's we have we have a liberal government right now. Um, so any disposition further towards those things, I think, would be an invitation um, for more abuse of that kind. 
there anything anyone wants to add to that or can I? Could oh. I add actually um, to what fellow worker Max was saying from the United States, um, if you're a US citizen that filed taxes between 2018 and 2019, um, they tiered the level of um, stimulus money that you got and the most you could get if you made under $75,000 in that year was $1,200. And then for every dependent that you had, it scaled up by $500. And if you filed your taxes electronically, that money would go into your bank account if you filed through some other services, a lot of people receive their checks physically and it took a lot longer for the physical checks to be received. So a lot of the individuals who received those checks, they had to wait somewhere between four and six weeks to get a max of around $1,200 that was then pretty much eaten up almost entirely by other debts that they had. And the federal government in the United States essentially said, we're, that's the only check you're receiving. We're not going to provide an additional stimulus package. Um, they did increase unemployment benefits on top of what you're receiving in your state. But now that states are reopening, um, governors are saying, if you're told to go back to work and you refuse to, that is considered you leaving your job, even if it's for um, a fear for your health and your safety, you must return back. Otherwise, that's considered quitting your job and you cannot receive any unemployment benefits. And what we've seen, which is kind of in some ways unique to the United States, is the people who were very strong supporters of um, the president prior to this took a look at their checks. They've called it Trump bucks. Um, he would sign little letters that said like from the president of the United States, um, basically using this as a way to provide assistance to his campaign for this year's election. And it's sort of galvanizing the right wing in our country that say, you know, the president is looking out for us. He's providing us this money. No other president would do this. And so it helps bolster his credibility with his base. And at the same time, he's also using his power to um, push a lot of these far right wing protesters to go into capitals where the governor might be of the opposing party, but it's considered a swing state and he needs to win that. And he's using this heightened economic anxiety to provoke this very militant, very well armed, very dangerous base of his supporters to both say, I will protect you, but the people directly below me, your, your democratic governors, they're not going to support you. And so the challenge that we face right now in the United States, at least, is um, we are not expecting people to receive additional funding at this point. So they are now relying on their governors who have received a lot of funding from the federal government to then distribute it to people in need. But many Republican governors in the United States are now sitting on this uh, slush fund upwards of, you know, one point two billion dollars that then they need to redistribute to the people in those states. And so they're finding ways of like circumventing um, the process. Some are like Max said giving it to businesses to then distribute to the citizens themselves. Some are trying to distribute it directly to citizens and others are just sitting with this money, not distributing it at all. And a campaign around sort of a universal basic income, I think would be very challenging in the United States, depending on you know, what the political landscape looks at the time. If it occurs under a far right-wing government like we're seeing now, I think it would only protect that government institution long term and regardless of what happens at the polls it would sort of re-entrench the far right of our of our country okay thanks for them yeah rather broad analysis uh, we have a statement um, in the chat about the basic income and it says basic income will probably in the long run undermine the power of the unions 
blocking effective force to change the economic system rather than just preventing rising unemployment and safe mass consumption. So maybe with that the last, being the last word on the basic income, we have a couple of more questions for you guys. A Swedish fellow worker writes, we have seen in Sweden, we have seen see cases of three to 40% infection rates at elderly care homes run by private companies. Are you seeing similar problems with private companies in your own countries? That would probably be also uh, interesting uh, for Brianna, but first, Russ. Yeah, it certainly seems to be the situation here. Um, uh, for a long time, the uh, information coming out of care homes has uh, just not been accessible, uh, uh, available to people. Um, and that's one of the um, things that's happened is that um, the situation with the employment and, and all the rest for in uh, care homes again has come to the fore. And it'd be interesting, that will be a, a sector that'd be interesting to see whether or not there is uh, an increased militancy or a desire for uh, unionization in, in that sector coming out of the crisis. Um, yes, we're, 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 we're now getting the idea that basically, I mean, we've just had the, the numbers of deaths increased by about four or five thousand, which uh, is, I think, probably a conservative estimate of how many people have already died in the care homes. Someone else has an answer to the question from the Swedish fellow worker. I mean, I would uh, definitely Hi, go ahead, Brianna. Uh, this is Brianna. Um, yeah, the the numbers in the U.S. are not coming out overall. Um, as Russ said, we're just not getting that information, similar to the prisons. Um, but there was one facility where I don't know if the, the workers there got sick or if they were just not comfortable going back to work without any protective equipment. Uh, but no one showed up to check on the people in this one facility for uh, a couple days. So that was really bad. Um, and the facilities that do get hit with the virus are being devastated. Um, there's There's it's very bad. Yeah, the only thing I would add is definitely that is taking place. Um, and in Quebec, th in Canada, the majority of cases are in Quebec, and the majority of cases are in like senior citizens' homes and things like that. We have had some of them described as literal concentration camps uh, because people were put, they were the healthcare system and the elderly care system, the long-term health, uh, long-term like stay healthcare system has been already, it's such a bad state that when this hit, you know, workers were forced to continue working without protections. And then a lot of them, you know, went on strike um, and were not able to keep up with it. And to some, to, to the point where uh, there had to be significant government interventions in running these, these locations, which, they've had to admit that the problem was not specifically the virus, but all of the po accumulated policies that have led us to this point. The only thing I would um, push back against is actually, I, and I think this is different in different countries, but the distinction between public and private sector has become very weak. There's so much, so much uh, partner, so many partnerships going on, partnerships that are not even very clearly visible to the population that you have to look quite carefully at who's providing all of the services, who's providing the workers, who's providing the food, who's providing you know medical equipment to a particular long-term care home, that the distinction seems uh, in a lot of cases to be almost not very even useful. Um, not to mention the fact that a lot of people in working for the state have come from the private sector and returned to the private sector um, that they kind of it, it ceased to have in many ways, like um, at least in, in Canada, like often a meaningful distinction. I agree with Max. Uh, in the US, there is little to no distinction between public and privately owned facilities, both prisons and elder care facilities. 
Although the super rich folks can get into really nice elder care facilities where they are actually taken care of, but I think that it costs, um, it starts at $5,000 per month. Actually, you know, I have to correct myself. There is one very important distinction that continues to exist, even though every other distinction is almost totally meaningless, which is in many places in North America, if you are classified as a state employee, you are not covered by the labor laws. So below the normal, very, very weak protections, you are not covered with, for example, you cannot defend you with even the weakest forms of unfair labor practice complaints. You do not have the right to collective bargaining. You do not have a right to strike. You, you do not have protected activity for you working in concert with your, with your coworkers to improve your, your working conditions. And so it's very wild west in organizing those sectors. It is happening, but uh, it is, the, so the workers bear all the responsibilities without any of the benefits of being state workers. If no one wants to add anything, we have one more question from the audience. Um, are there any states separate from the US removing liability and worker safety protections to their industries in order to spur the economy or other such nonsense? Brendan, do you want to take a stab at that one? Could you restate that question? I'm sorry, I, d I don't know if I understood it correctly. Um, I can also write it into the chat for a moment. Um, I think it's a question from a fellow worker from the state because it says, are there any states separate from the US removing liability and worker safety protections to their industries in order to spur the economy and other such, such nonsense? Oh, okay, sorry, I thought it was about the United States. No, but Canada or, I don't know, Germany, Switzerland, England. I mean, definitely in Canada, like we have a law, like we have regulations about people's right to refuse to work in unsafe conditions. And that has been totally unrespected. Immediately when this, when this virus hit, the Canadian, the business community let the government know they will absolutely not tolerate uh, people using the existing protections. And in Quebec in specific, we have an added layer that does not exist in the rest of Canada, where you can refuse to work not just because it's unsafe for you, but you're like, it's unsafe for somebody that is that is close to you, that you're like taking care of, that you're that it will impact someone close to you, uh, which of course, this is a prime example of that. And the government has signaled in no uncertain terms that it will not hear complaints about this. If you refuse to work, on the basis that it's dangerous for you or dangerous for someone that is in your care or that is close to you under these regulations, the government will not enforce those regulations. So at least on that dimension, probably many others, but that's the main one that I've main one that I've heard of in Canada. Um, yeah, I don't know if I um, understand the question correctly, but I think, also here we have a, a couple of, oh, Russ, are you still with us? Okay, that's just, okay. Um, we have a couple of fellow workers um, having troubles with safety measures um, being really like put in place at their workplace and that's in the care sector and also in like social work. But for example, one fellow worker is uh, working at a kind of a food truck and they didn't have any sort of security glass between them and the customers. And so it's like unsafe for both the customer and the, the workers there. And we hear stories like that um, in this solidarity telephone um, we, we installed for this time where people can call and complain about whatever issues, job related issues, money related issues they have. Um, now with Corona, but also else. And a lot of people complain about this kind of stuff. But I mean, of course, it's in order to spur the economy, but, um, and there is probably too little intervention by the state, also compared with what happened yesterday when we were trying to um, 
yeah, make our solidarity telephone a bit more popular and we were arrested and like it was such a big thing and this whole security thing was really important to them at the workplace, the state doesn't really look so close. Also, for example, at construction sites where workers try to go on strike um, in, yeah, in the French speaking part of Switzerland. Um, this wasn't really, it was a big discussion when uh, the can we like the canton the state of Tessin, uh, the Italian speaking um, part of Switzerland, um, changed their or closed down some sites, and then there was this big thing um, on federal level whether this was okay to kind of for this um, one state to have stronger measures on their sites than it was nationally planned. So it is an issue here as well. Russ is back. Tech committee, are there any more questions? Or does anyone of you want to add something? One question, which was, um, there are no more questions, <laughs> Texas. Um, the one question which was open and already posed a couple of times is how we want to proceed or what is like the thing we take out of this, us as, as fellow workers, as um, active members of the IWW, um, what kind of, yeah, to maybe not follow the very pessimistic view from of Russ. How can we use this, this connection we established today to work on in the future? Um, do we want to have a so, sort of a more open discussion around every once in a while? Um, so on. It's a question to all of you, maybe like, what do you expect? Um, uh, Segway? Yeah. Okay, yes. Yes, so this, uh, what is, I think happened, and it's very much to your, your initiative in the organizing committee in, uh, in Glamrock, so the German speaking area. Uh, what has, yeah, so this thing, having these meetings, you also organized a meeting within or between Germany and Austria and, uh, and uh, Switzerland, and that was also very nice. And I think this is something that we, uh, most of our members probably is expecting or hoping for or thinking that this is the only way to go. So I think this is very positive and we should uh, somehow continue. It's also very motivating even if the situation is not motivating but it's very motivating to to meet and see and hear other uh, bobbies or, or fellow workers in, on different in different countries continents so i hope we somehow can go more in this direction um i'm also really in favor of continuing those conferences they're really nice um but what we had, uh, what we uh, published in our um, letter for the 1st of May in the IWW Vienna was that, um, and I think that's important that we don't lose that momentum of people being frustrated with um, capitalism and established unions. <clears throat> and I think that's a point we have to work on really hard so that we can continue the struggle and people not forgetting about it and going back to the status quo like it was before. I think certainly as well, it would be very reasonable for the very the administrations and the ROCs, the regional organizing um, committees that exist to call for international a series of international meetings that would have some decision making power where we could discuss, you know, uh, some shared directives, uh, shared 
you know, trajectories and kind of take collective stock, like what our, our, what are the objectives that we are all sharing? What are some common strategies that we can use and kind of make some big picture uh, alignments? Uh, I think a lot of us are working under some like basic values and then just start going in whatever direction fits our local conditions. But I think it would, it would be of a great value for us to like, for example, have a strategic discussion of like, what should we prioritize this year? or for the next two years, or what could be a five-year plan for the IWW at a certain level internationally, take, keeping in mind what Russ has had, like being extremely pragmatic but, and maybe even extremely realist about what we could do, but nevertheless setting some basic characteristics. The other thing is just on an organizing level, like we would love to be in touch with, at the organizing department, with our counterparts in other countries organizing departments as would our other officers we have an education department we have an you know we have a training department uh we should be sharing we should be discussing more often and i'll just share like we had a we had a, a case here at a major uh company that was doing subtitling like doing like uh captioning for people who like can't hear so they're watching like the subtitles on a tv program and the way it worked is that it was program the it was, the, it was filmed in the UK sent to Montreal and to Duluth, Georgia for processing by cheap workers because, and the company said, um, the they had already saturated the European la labor market, the workers were expensive, like here are some cheap workers who lack labor rights, and we were able to organize with workers who were already unionized at the company in the UK, uh, in Australia, in Spain, and in France, and we were able to connect with UK IWW members to carry out actions in support of us in the city of London. And that was immensely helpful. It was, it was immensely helpful because European workers, you may see many problems in your labor movement, but you have in many ways, many more rights than we do. You have a lot, of, you have a lot more tools in your toolbox. And in fact, like, we need your help. Uh, when we're unionizing a company that exists where you are, we need your help to help uh, because you have so many, in some ways, more protections. Of course, you have many obstacles, um, and so to target specific companies that we can take on together to be in touch with um, uh, would be would be, I think, extremely to everybody's advantage. And we need to kind of unify the various organizing departments that exist at the national or regional level that we have. Brianna. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, I agree completely with Max, and I can't tell y'all um, enough how much it means to us in the U.S. to have international solidarity. Like, just even comments on Facebook or any tiny little bit of acknowledgement from somewhere else in the world means so much to us. Um, like during the prisoner strikes of 2016, we people in prison in uh, Germany sent pictures of themselves in solidarity with us. And um, it, it just means the world on every subject to be able to communicate with people outside of this horrible little bubble that we live in. Um, yeah, no, um, yeah, thanks. And it kind of is a bit confusing for us, like having people from NARA saying, yeah, we need your help in Europe because we feel exactly the same way the other way around. Mm -hmm. I noticed that, uh, like this past, uh, year, I spent quite a lot of time in Belgium and France and Germany. And it was, I was honestly very surprised how much of the German and French and, and Belgian labor movement were looking towards the United States and were looking towards Canada and the names of organizers and what was happening. And uh, in fact, actually, we also need to look to you. In many ways, we have reached a lot of obstacles, a lot of ve like very big challenges. In some ways, our conversations, our dialogues have become, have, have gotten stuck. And we need your experiences uh, to, un to get us unstuck. So I think in many ways, actually, I was, I, what, I, what I was trying to convey is there's a lot of cool stuff happening in North America. Um, and I think a lot, the, some of the best stuff that can be imported is the sense of like thinking outside of the labor relations system and pushing as strategically, smartly, but 
playing around that system and not getting entrenched, not getting like uh, uh, entrenched in that bureaucracy. But uh, there's so much that we need to learn from you. There's so many ways that we're that we're stuck and we need your help. Um, I want to ask one last maybe question because it kind of fits in here to Yoshi, the third member of our organizing and education committee in Glamrock. And just today, um, he and some fellow workers started a Glamrock wide project. And I think this is also one where um, international help and exchange of ideas would be a good thing. Maybe Yoshi, you want to join in for the very last few moments and talk about that. Yeah, uh, thank you. You can hear me all? Okay. Uh, sorry, that's uh, just a bit from, from the off here. I just did the tech. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, this morning uh, we had just a small meeting with uh, um, another fellow worker from Munich and we were thinking if um, what should we do at the moment also depends on like how do we analyze the situation in the way that we have like an like one part of our class has like a massive unemployment. It's like, I don't know, there are some, uh, some numbers that say 1.6 billion workers in the world are like unemployed right now. So that basically for us as a union and always the strategy of building power in the workplace means that uh, somehow there's not so much uh, place for, for building a power perhaps right now. That's like one part of the class. And the other part of the class is um, especially workers in, in retail or also in, in healthcare and social work and so on. They have a lot more power, perhaps, if we compare that, like historically, more to people um, who worked like in the flight sector or so on. So and at the airports, which had like a big, um, big tradition of, of struggles and so on. Um, so and how do we fit this or do we need like two-way strategy for different parts of the class in the way that also if we talk about online organizing training there's this always this part of well know your rights and so on but what do we do with our um, colleagues that uh, struggle with uh, like getting money from the state and so on and who are not employed right now just as one part and like i'm a social worker so i'm still in i'm still working um, and for me, it's uh, like a bit unprecedented to say, oh, yeah, we have so much power, we could do something with it, but I'm not sure what we should do. Um, so uh, so th that was the question, like, what should we do with this big division of the class? And um, just one thing we came up is uh, this idea to at least, I don't know, like make posters and also this um, translate this uh, COVID strategy um, organizing um, paper from, from the IWW in Portland uh, and perhaps link that to the way, I don't know, let's get out and put on posters on the, uh, for, for healthcare workers or for my social worker colleagues and so on and so forth to get a bit more, like build power up where perhaps there, um, there, there is nothing on, on not much organizing at, at the moment. Not not sure if that is the right strategy, just to give you some idea what we were thinking about. But please go on. Thanks, Tech and Yoshi for that and also for the whole tech you did. Um, I think, yeah, we are almost out of time and it's also a good moment to close with this um, perspective of future work. Um, I think we will anyway keep in touch and set up another meeting also for the people who are only watching on YouTube now because we know now that people were here from Greece, from Sweden, um, I don't know, probably from our uh, regions as well. And so there, there is a lot of stuff we could um, continue on one last thing also, uh, it popped into my mind because of it was a project we did in um, Glamrock um, for the anniversary of the burger wheel strike, I think it was. And 
it was mainly Yoshi's work as well. Um, he set up kind of an interactive website, um, a storytelling website on the big successes of these fast food working worker unions, uh, which is also a thing, at least in the German speaking part of Europe, I don't know how it is elsewhere, but we are impressed uh, by from yeah, unions in NARA, how you really are successful with organizing and how this radical way of doing stuff actually works, which might be connected to your way weaker um, laws and circumstances there. And Yoshi, do you want to talk about the project or just share the link for everybody? And we can have some final votes from our guests. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just posted the, the links and also in the commentary on, on YouTube. But uh, honestly, I would be more interested to the things I said <laughs> or I asked you. But um, like you're the moderation, it's, it's, or perhaps it is more question like for a further meeting. I'm not sure. It's, uh, it's, I know it's this big question. I, I didn't want to pose it like at the end. Is, I, I just um, just did not know when, when to put it in. So sorry. No, no, perfect. I mean, if, if sure, people uh, can respond to that, of course. I didn't want to. Could you maybe like restate the question? Um, okay, the thing is, what should we do with, with this big division in our class between this big part who is like unemployed on the one hand and also this other part like social work and healthcare and so on, which has like so much power and what is the right way to, to act within this uh, division? And we could also say, is there perhaps like some historical um, examples that we could uh, think of to, to use that in this situation? Uh, hi, this is Brianna. Um, so there have historically been unemployed movements, which I don't know a lot about. I could see it working like hand in hand with workers' movements. Like it, it should definitely be a thing. Um, unemployed people are unemployed workers, which are working class, which are workers. Uh, and I'm not sure... I mean, I feel like my overall instinct on everything is that the people who are most affected by something are the ones who should be leading the conversations and the dialogues and the movement. Uh, so for me, I would be willing to support whatever unemployed movement happens, but wouldn't necessarily like personally lead one or organize one myself. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that, like, so in the European context, um, the unions in many countries are much more intimately involved in the welfare system. Uh, for example, in Iceland, when, you're, when your uh, workplace sick days run out, the unions are actually a part of administrating sick leave. Um, I know that in Belgium as well, many of the kind of like things that in North America we would consider as coming from the government come from the unions themselves. So you have to go to a union office and apply for some kinds of benefits if you're unemployed. I don't know to what degree the situation is replicating itself in other European countries right now, but uh, essentially if you are part of the healthcare system uh, and the social work system, uh, like you know, being unionized as a member of those unions that have such a gigantic control over the welfare systems that are supporting unemployed people gives you a huge opportunity like to go inside of those unions and form a block where you can pressure them to take control of those welfare systems. I mean, uh, uh, like it, we should be taking control of those welfare systems uh, uh, and pushing the union administration to use them in more, uh, more just ways. I, I believe that um, it would be more effective to go in and change the course of some of these gigantic sectoral unions where everybody can vote, everybody can be a member of them, everybody can vote in them, you could be an active member in them rather than try to like petition the state for a particular kind of change. Um, if you're already unionizing those unions and there's not like 
a realistic path for you to make IWW the main union that represents your workplace, uh, which in many European countries is like not realistic. So, I mean, that's one thing that comes to my mind. Does that answer your question, Yoshi? Okay, um, well then, with that, I really want to thank all of and only a bit he just said, okay. Um, to thank all of you and we will um, surely keep in contact and set up a meeting maybe during May to recap what happened tonight and to yeah develop some of the ideas which are out there now. Anybody wants to have some final words? If not, then I wish you a good day or night. I um, have final words. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. I've got an echo now. I have to mute my computer. Um, so a solidarity to all the prisoners everywhere. And thank you all so much for hosting this. You have done an amazing job of managing like all of this stuff so that it looks seamless. Um, so you all are awesome. Thank you and solidarity. Solidarity to you too. And well, OK. See you. Goodbye. Bye. And Thanks, bye everybody. To all the listeners and viewers on YouTube, if you have 